G'day, my name's Richard Brown. I'm the Managing Director of Cogato Group. Cogato Group is a company that uh, does a lot of PKI work. So what I thought I might do today is actually run you through a bit of a PKI 101. So firstly, we wanted to just cover why we would use PKI, what PKI entities are, the difference between symmetric and asymmetric key cryptography, X509 certificates, a bit of a certificate life cycle uh, wrap up, a little bit about certificate revocation lists and validation authorities in general, and then some legislation policies and procedures, but we're gonna be quite light on that. Okay, so in the past, we've had the idea of a paper-based trust. So people actually use a piece of paper to sign a document, uh, create a legally binding contract, those sorts of things. And that's worked pretty good, except it doesn't translate well into the, into the electronic world. So in a paper-based society, we wrote that letter or we signed it. Uh, we perhaps had a witness verify the authenticity of that particular document. We then put the letter in an envelope and we sent it across maybe in certified mail. This gave the recipient the, the confidence that basically the contents had not been read by anybody else, but more importantly, that with the contents of the envelope intact, that that hadn't changed in any way and that the person who sent it was in fact the person who they thought sent it. So PKI has four cornerstones that it's actually trying to achieve. The first one is authentication, and that's about an individual or an identity, even a device, actually authenticating who they are, purporting to be somebody that they are and having something trust that. The second is confidentiality, which is basically encryption. It's the idea of uh, covering or creating obfuscation to uh, some information. Integrity is about ensuring that something doesn't change, and non-repudiation is about ensuring that a person who sends something can't say they didn't send it, or a device that sends something can be secure in the knowledge that it was actually that device. So authentication can be used for a number of different things. Often authentication is used to log on to a system, but it can also, so Windows log on, for instance, through smart card log on, or virtual smart card log on can be used, but even simplified or single sign on can be used as log on. Uh, it can also be used to authenticate to a service. It can even be used by services to authenticate to one another. Confidentiality is that idea of encryption and we can use that in key negotiation. An example is transport layer security. That's about a web browser talking to an internet bank, for instance. So we use it every day. Uh, message or document encryption, but it can also be used for server and client communications, whether that be a server in the traditional sense or even a router or switch, any device really at all. What we can do with certificates also is that integrity component where we can ensure that if we sign a document or a transaction, that can't be altered without us knowing it's being altered. Non-repudiation is that idea about document signatures and message signatures ensuring who it came from or what it came from. So how does PCAR provide assurance? Well, the first thing we have to talk about is the idea of encryption. And there's two main forms of encryption symmetric encryption and asymmetric encryption. So PKI traditionally uses the asymmetric encryption within its own services, but then it actually uses symmetric cryptography to bring that across as well. Digital signing also uses the idea of one-way hashes. So encryption uh, concepts. Uh, encryption is the process of turning plain text into ciphertext or something that can't be read without the ability to decrypt it which is turning that ciphertext back into the plain text so it's readable or usable. Encryption and decryption requires an algorithm and generally a key. It can actually take one or more keys though. Uh, so there are two main cipher types being symmetric and asymmetric. So basically the idea with symmetric key cryptography is it uses the, the same key at both ends of a, a encryption transaction. So the key that encrypts the data is also used to decrypt the data, as you can see in the diagram there. So the characteristics are that it has very high performance when you compare it to asymmetric key cryptography, that the key management is shared, so I have the same key at both ends, and 
that can be one of the biggest issues of it that I have to get the key to the other end. Uh, it's not practical for a large number you uh, a large number of users because of that shared nature as well, and it's useful for fast encryption and decryption. So examples are AES uh, and Triple Des IDEA RC4. So a number of ones. AES is probably the one that's actually used most now. Uh, that's the advanced encryption standard as ratified by NIST. Okay, so asymmetric key cryptography differs in that it actually has two keys. One key is used for encryption and the other key is used for decryption. So these two keys are mathematically related, but they're not the same. And the key used for encryption cannot be used for decryption. That won't work. You have to use the other mathematically related key. So you can see in the diagram that we actually take uh, the public key and we use, we use the public key to do an encryption and then we use the private key to do the decryption. Asymmetric key cryptography is also known as public key cryptography. So the public key is made public, everybody has access to it, and the private key is actually kept private. So it never leaves the, the storage of the place where it was generated. So whether that be on an individual's hard drive or smart card or token, or the server's uh, registry hard drive, or even a HSM. So the private key is generally used uh, to encrypt certain types of traffic, uh, then only the public key can decrypt it as we said before. Uh, if I'm sending something to somebody though, if it's me that's sending it, I'll use their public key because then only they can actually decrypt it with their private key. So about the key pair, as I said, they're mathematic relate, mathematically related. They're derived from very, very, very large uh, prime numbers and they're infeasible to determine one knowing the other. And they come in different st key strengths as well. So the characteristics are that uh, the performance is slower, so it's not practical for bulk encryption. Uh, the key management, public key can be widely distributed and it works well for large groups of people. Uh, and it's useful for encryption, signing and key exchange. So key exchange is the concept of, I might actually use public key to transfer a, a symmetric key that can do the bulk encryption faster. Uh, and it, it's got some examples there of asymmetric key cryptography. The main one at the moment is RSA. Uh, ECC is actually a set of a suite of uh, algorithms. So it's not just one. So elliptic curve cryptography is a suite of algorithms. And in fact, there's an EC DSA as one of those curves. So the best solution, as I said, is to actually use the symmetric algorithm for the bulk encryption and create a new random key every time that you want to do one of those bulk encryptions. So where I join to my internet bank, uh, I'll actually create a new session key each time. The asymmetric key algorithm is used for the exchange of those keys. And so again, in that web-based internet banking scenario, what will happen is that my client, my browser, will actually talk to the server and they will actually do a key exchange using public key infrastructure or asymmetric key cryptography and give me a symmetric key that will be my session key that I'll actually use to do the encryption of the actual bulk traffic that I send to and fro from the internet banking site. So then we get onto one-way hashes. They're a little bit different. A hash is produced by data through a hashing algorithm. So it's a fixed length of data that acts like a fingerprint to a larger set of data. And it's used to determine if the data has changed, uh, possibly maliciously, but it's also used in circumstance like just straight data transfer where I do a hash in order to make sure that the data hasn't been corrupted along the way. Uh, it's the idea of a secure hash is that it's impossible or infeasible to produce a document which mat matches that digest. That's called collisions. So collisions have been, uh, they have been created and that's basically when a secure hashing algorithm reaches the end of its life is when I can actually produce known collisions and make changes to data uh, as I see fit. So Basically, in a hash though, if one bit 
and an entire data set changes, the hash should change completely. So the characteristics are that there is actually no key involved in this. It is an irreversible process because it's a fixed length, short length, uh, bit length uh, hash, and that means that it doesn't actually produce, you can't produce the document or the data back from it. Um, examples are MD5, SHA1, SHA2, um, and even SHA3, which is a, a more a newer algorithm that's been ratified only in the last few years. So MD5 is known to be broken, but it's still useful for things like data, ensuring that data hasn't changed. SHA1 is actually now, now has uh, known collisions as well. So we're really moving to SHA2 as one of the main hash, secure hashing algorithms around. So public key cryptography uses hashes or digest also to do integrity checks and to produce digital signatures. So what happens is the data actually goes into a hashing algorithm. It comes out the other end as a message digest or a hash. And then we actually encrypt that data using an asymmetric key to ensure that the data actually is secure. So that one way hash integrity, as you can see, uh, the message goes from uh, a user and it goes into a hashing algorithm. That hashing algorithm up the top there is actually created and the message digest is then attached. Then the, di the digest and the message are actually sent to the recipient. The recipient then grabs out that uh, message digest, also does their own copy of the message digest, and you can see they check that they're the same. If they're the same, that means that the message hasn't changed at all. So a one-way hash with a digital signature just means that we actually use the, pri the, the, the sender's private key to sign that algorithm or encrypt it so that we know that it can't be changed. And then anybody can actually unencrypt that data if they have access to the public key, but we know the person who encrypted it had to be the person who sent it. So there's four simple rules related to this. You sign first, then you encrypt. You compress before you encrypt. You sign using your private key and you encrypt using the send or the recipient's public key. So the algorithms as we've discussed, uh, some symmetric key algorithms there again, AES, triple DES, ID, EA. The only one that's in most use now is the AES. There is still a lot of triple DES, but that's an older standard. And so it's really deprecated now. There is other versions of DES, um, the data encryption standard, so we can actually get two DES in, in different flavors and there is in fact even DES, but it's very rare that you would see DES, even triple DES is starting to get a bit rare now. Asymmetric key algorithms, as I said, RSA is probably the biggest one out there. Elliptic curve is also out there now in, um, in a bit of, there's, a, there's quite a few sites, but quantum cryptography could actually overtake that. So some of the hashing algorithms, as I said, SHA-1 and MD-5 are basically de deprecated now and SHA-1 is not used for PKIs anymore and MD-5 uh, hasn't been for a long time. So SHA-2 really is the staple there, the, the main one. And there's a lot of pseudo-random number generators as well. And those pseudo-random number generators are designed to be used so that we can take, uh, we can create those big keys, those big prime numbers. So how do we secure the storage of that private key? Because that's a critical component. We really need to make sure that's secure. Well, there's a number of ways. The first way is that we actually keep it in a file. And a PKCS11, uh, so the public key cryptography standards number 12, actually goes through a way of actually doing that in a standards-based way. And that way is number 12. So we can also use proprietary ways uh, and we can use just password-based encryption as well in a zip file, for instance. However, a better way to do that would be to use a smart card or a virtual smart card. Smart cards have a number of protections on them, including PIN protection, but also the fact that they're hardware, they're harder to crack into, they have protections against tampering as well. All the way down the other end, the most secure really is the hardware security modules. And there's a number of companies that actually produce hardware security modules. I've just put down a number of them there. So the TELUS, Gemalto SafeNet, Lunar Series, 
uh, Utomatico and Shoreware Keeper are, are four that I've got down there as hardware security module suppliers. So how do we solve the four security needs? So we've learned some things about symmetric and asymmetric key cryptography, digital signature ha and hashing, uh, and we can, we've learned about how the, the four mechanisms to really achieving uh, a secure transactions are brought about. So confidentiality is that encryption, symmetric keys, shared secret, and then the use of public key infrastructure to give me that asymmetric keys to actually key and cipher the actual, the, the larger or the, the other key. How do we solve those four security needs? Well, we used a combination of symmetric and asymmetric key cryptography, along with hashing algorithms and digital signatures to combine all that stuff to achieve the goals of confidentiality, integrity, authentication, and non-repudiation. So thanks for listening. Uh, I really appreciate it. The next, uh, there are a number of other videos, including uh, more about certificates and PKI them itself, uh, as well as a number of other things on our website. So please go there and, uh, and have a bit of a look. Thanks for listening.